So this is an interesting concept because in my practice, when I was in Houston, I practiced with my father. And I had a plant-based program because I'm board certified in medical management and in surgical management. So some people I treat medically and some people I treat surgically based on some of their factors in their history, but also on, on what they want to do. And so I was starting to randomize people and see, well, what if I said to someone, I want you to do the plant-based diet instead of the surgery? And we were looking at the results, and uh, my father, who's kind of an old curmudgeon, I mean, think of an old grumpy surgeon, uh, and he's looking over the results, and he goes, you know what I think? And I was like, what? What do you think? He's like, I think you're committing malpractice. Which, right? Because I'm telling people to eat salads? That's malpractice? And he said, you're withholding from them a surgery that could benefit them way more than you're benefiting them with the, with the plant-based diet. You see where my existential crisis comes from? My dad. <laughs> but when you look at, uh, again, we got to think globally. Like globally, no question. We need, and I'll tell you why we need to get people eating plants and, and how that could prevent obesity long term. But when I'm looking at Marcus here, I got to think a little bit differently. And the problem is a lot of people will look at Marcus and think obesity is not a disease. In fact, when they poll people, most people think obesity isn't a disease. They think we're taking people to the operating room while they're eating double cheeseburgers. Or they think, you know, it's not that diabetes, heart disease, and obesity run in your family. It's that no one runs in your family. As if, you know, <laughs> if Marcus ran, it would all get better. Or this idiot who was like, dear obese PhD applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation. Can you believe the guy tweeted that? I mean, first of all, thinking that carbs are the problem. So he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about, but what a rude statement. Imagine what Marcus would feel like reading that. Would that help? Does shaming someone help them lose weight? And of course, he has to offer his sincere apologies for his idiotic statement, and, but he still lost his job. But the thing is, you've got to understand that the um, <laughs> justice is served. The simple act of saying I'm hungry is not so simple, all right? It's not that simple. We always think, right, what happens? You, you go on a diet and you do well in the beginning, right? Someone offers you a cake and you say, I don't want that cake, I'm on a diet. But three weeks later, someone offers you a cake and you're like, oh my God, that looks so good. Is that Betty Crocker? <laughs> and next thing you know, you're eating cake. And then what do you say? Because I, I, I talk to patients all the time, right? What happened? Well, I failed the diet. I failed the diet. Did they fail the diet? They think of it as a, I didn't have the willpower to do the diet. Okay, willpower is a thought process, right? I am thinking I'm going to will my way through this. That comes from this part of the brain, all right? Hunger is determined by this part of the brain, the hypothalamus and the brainstem, the ancient brain, the brain that formed a gazillion years ago, right? The brain that formed in times of feast or famine, all right? We have this big, huge, stretchable stomach. When I cut that stomach out, if we stain it for elastic, it's got elastic fibers in it. It's made to stretch, all right? Now, whether you believe in evolution or intelligent design, that stomach wasn't designed for us to get our money's worth at a buffet, all right? It was designed so that we can eat when food wasn't around because food usually wasn't around, all right? Winter was coming. Now, winter is here, and we could go to McDonald's at 2 in the morning. But those kind of factors work against us now. So what may have been protective for Marcus a gazillion years ago is no longer protective for Marcus. But his body still thinks, his body's still designed for that feast or famine. And it's a very complex thing. Hunger is extremely complex. There are all kinds of variables that fit into this very primitive part of the brain. The part of the brain, by the way, that determines how much you breathe, how fast your heart rate is. You could hold your breath for a while, but then you're gonna breathe. You could try to change your heart rate, but it's gonna keep going. You could try not to eat, but you're gonna fail eventually. And it's because this is a very primitive, protective part of the brain. And there's feeding into it. Ghrelin hormone, a hormone that comes from the stomach that we'll talk about, PYY from the intestines, the vagus nerve, fat secretes something called leptin we're going to talk about. And people have different responses to this, and a lot of it is genetically encoded. There's definitely genes that predispose us towards being overweight. If you look at twin studies where they took twins, oh, I've got 57 minutes left, right? Okay, right? Oh, good. I thought I had three minutes left. I was like, oh, my God. I've been going on too long. Okay, um, when you look at twin studies, they, they took twins that were separated at birth, grew up in different environments, 
And then they looked at them. If you look at monozygotic twins, identical twins, it, it doesn't make a difference what their environment was, right? Even in a shared environment, it didn't make a difference. But look at this, in a shared environment, dizygotic twins, non-identical twins, look at the differences. In fact, in twin studies, weight is the most inherited gene we have on par with height, more than hair color and eye color and things like that. And there's many genes that we're looking at now. A lot of it we don't know yet, but we know that there's big differences between people. We've done these functional MRI studies. If you look at a normal person's brain, I don't like to say normal, a normal weight person's brain, the red indicates dopamine receptors. If you got a lot of dopamine receptors and you eat food and it stimulates dopamine, you get a like, ah, I just ate. I'm fine. I'm good, right? I had my salad. I'm good. Now, I want you to look at a brain of an obese person. Where are the dopamine receptors? They don't have it. And what happens then? They're desperate for something to stimulate that brain to say, I'm satisfied. They don't get that satisfaction. And it looks a lot like the brain of a cocaine addict or of an alcoholic. And even worse yet, whether it's genes, it also may be what's called epigenetics. Have you guys heard of epigenetics? What mom ate while baby is in the tummy could have a big difference too. We know that certain foods that mom eats can affect the genes and the way the genes are activated in the baby. And get this, this blows my mind. They know this about smoking and they're thinking it about obesity too that what mom eats or smokes affects the baby, but if it's a female baby, it also affects the female baby's eggs. So that when that female baby grows up and has a baby, that baby is affected by what its grandmother did when she was pregnant, which is crazy. So before we go blaming patients, maybe we need to blame their grandparents. It goes back, it's very complicated. And a lot of it goes to different kind of coding. So what are these genes coding for? Well, they're coding for these different hormones. Some people produce more ghrelin, which makes you hungry. Ghrelin's an interesting hormone made by the stomach. If you start fasting, your ghrelin level continually goes up. If you go on a diet, the ghrelin level continues to go up and you become very hungry. Now, interestingly, if I do a weight loss surgery where I cut out part of the stomach, that ghrelin level drops dramatically. So when people have had weight loss surgery, it's not that they're forced not to eat. They just don't feel like eating because they have a lot lower ghrelin level. Leptin is another very interesting hormone. Our fat cells secrete a hormone called leptin. And that leptin, again, goes to that primitive part of the brain. Leptin is supposed to tell the brain, okay, we got fat on store, we're good. All right, we're good. We could, we could handle a winter of fasting. If you start losing leptin because you're losing fat, so you go on a diet, you start losing fat, less fat cells, less leptin, Less leptin, the brain says, oh my God, I don't have enough fat. I need to get the person eating again. There's another hormone called PYY. Again, it increases hunger. And so there's many different factors. In fact, your gut microbiome may be a big factor in how hungry you are, how much you eat, or even what your metabolism is. I don't know you guys have heard about, have you heard about transpusions? Do you know what that is? It's this idea of taking someone else's feces uh, and ingesting it to change your microbiome. Now, uh, yeah, this is happening. <laughs> Wonderful world of science. Um, it, it, right now, the only indication for it is to treat a bacteria called C. diff, which happens in hospitals quite frequently now, is becoming uh, antibiotic resistant. So there was a case where there was a thin woman who had C. diff, so she got a transpusion. And she got it from her daughter-in-law who was overweight, and six months later, she was overweight. So now with transfusions, you can't get it from someone who's overweight. But it's interesting because there may be a lot with the microbiome, uh, and I'll get into a little bit later, on how it affects our weight. Interestingly, in some studies, now these are, uh, albeit mainly in rat studies, but with a gastric bypass, there's a great increase in the diversity of microbiome afterwards. And they think that maybe this increase in microbiome may be part of the reason the surgery works so effectively. But back to this idea, like when you think of an overweight patient and you think, okay, they're overweight because it's their choice and it's their mind, I wanna draw you to this study. Because there was a medication that came out called Ramonabon. Now Ramonabon works on the endocannabinoid receptors, the CBD receptors in the brain. And it blocks them. I guess they saw that people smoking pot got the munchies. So what if we block the munchies? Uh, and so this drug was extremely effective. It, it takes away your will to eat. 
Now, it didn't get FDA approval because it also takes away your will to live. <laughs> but it had some interesting studies because they put people on either a placebo, a sugar pill, or Ramonabon at five milligrams, Ramonabon at 20 milligrams. They don't know what they're getting, right? They're getting a pill. They didn't tell them anything about diet or exercise. Look at the differences between the 20 milligram, the five milligram, and the none. That's a pretty, they're not doing anything different. They're just getting a pill. Did they all of a sudden get willpower? Or is there some kind of chemical problem that they have, a disease that we are treating? Now, what's interesting is on this Ramonabon group, they're doing great, they're doing great. We're going to slip them a placebo right here. And look what happens. All of a sudden, they're lazy again. There's something more to this. And that's why it's so hard to portion control. And it's so hard, I like this meme. <laughs> You know, 12 o'clock, I'm going to save this uh, sandwich for later, 12.06. I'm going to finish that sandwich now. You know, it's, it's hard for us to do these things because our brain is working at a very fundamental level. Our body's working against us.